About 20 years ago, I read a German language book called Keltenschanzen, which roughly translates as Celtic squares or Celtic enclosures. According to the book, these were geomantic places of power used to influence weather and atop which Celtic warriors energetically charged themselves for battle. You see a Celtic square in this image. Even today, no information on this is available in English. You're hearing or reading the first write-up on it. I am not well-versed in geomancy and radiesthesia, so excuse any errors in translation or understanding. The author admits that the Celts were probably not the builders of the original squares. They used them, but the builders are of an older, forgotten age. The enclosed fields have also been named rectangular enclosures and nemedin. Only few of them are perfectly square. In old literature, the structures are called Druze nemedin. Druze means oak. Nemedin means sacred grove or a sacred clearing or glade in the woods. Europe is covered in hundreds of thousands of Celtic squares. Unbeknownst to most, they are the most common structure in the world. Almost all old towns and cities are surrounded by them, and they often come in a system of nine squares forming a ring. Nobody knows who made them. According to aerial archaeologists, Bavaria alone, the home of the author of aforementioned book, is known to have more than 40,000 Celtic squares, some of which I've personally visited. While there are no records of who made them, it appears the Celts knew how to repair them. Nowadays, most squares are no longer recognizable to the eye. They are grown over. The average size is that of a soccer field. It's surrounded by a ridge, bank, or wall surrounded by a ditch. The ditches were presumably created while digging to build the wall. The entrances usually pointed to the east, sometimes to the south or west, but never to the north. The enclosures were not for military or defense. They were not strategically placed, could be looked into from all sides, and the wall was rarely higher than 7 feet or 2 meters. Archaeologists have tried to brush them off as defense-related fortresses, but that's obviously not their purpose. A Celtic enclosure is not just any square. It had to possess certain geological and geomantic features, measurable with radiesthesia. The dictionary defines geomancy as relating to the art of placing or arranging buildings or other sites auspiciously. Radiesthesia is defined as a physical ability to detect radiation emitted by a person, animal, object, or geographical feature. These sciences are not accepted by modern academia, but without them, the Celtic squares cannot be understood. The enclosure was created by digging up earth a few feet and then refilling it with different soils and ingredients, layer by layer. The author of the aforementioned book and his team examined hundreds of Celtishanzen using scientific instruments as well as dowsing rods. They concluded the Celtic squares are giant condensers or capacitors that create an ionizing field above the square. For hundreds of years, farmers have observed that the fields influence the weather. With fields that are still intact, witnesses observe clouds open above the squares and thunderstorms have been redirected away from them. According to the author, the squares had another function. People went on the square to become energetically charged. Ancient reports speak of Celtic fury, a mental and physical state that Celtic warriors fought their battles in. Old depictions show them going into battle nude and screaming, often without weapons, and defeating their shielded, protected, and weaponized opponents. It's reported that the warriors had the strength to tear off their opponents' heads with their bare hands. To energize themselves, they performed ritual dance moves on the square, known as saltus. The energized state was known not to last long. Opponents eventually caught on and learned to let the frenzied, fired-up warriors run into emptiness. Once their heightened state wore off, their enemies attacked. In later eras, the now armed and armored Celtic knights apparently still knew how to use the squares. For combat, they used their bihander sword, a sword so heavy, up to 176 pounds or 80 kilograms. It requires two hands to carry. That's about as heavy as two bags of cement, 40 bricks, or 21 gallons of water. A normal human being of our day could barely carry it, let alone wage fights. The Celts were able to do it even with their heavy armor, because they performed their dancing rituals atop their squares. And so, for some time, 
They had what seemed like superhuman strength. There are not many Celtic squares still operational today, but those that are still have an energizing, rejuvenating effect on visitors, sometimes followed by a feeling of being worn out and lackluster days after. Some have even reported feeling sick after an initial high. The author says this is because we have not been taught how to use the squares and the kind of steps and moves to make. Because this knowledge was lost, the general populace later avoided the squares. Many were destroyed or declared taboo areas by our ancestors. On the other hand, many were also used to build military bases, churches, and sports fields on. I'm undecided on whether this ancient tech is generally positive or negative. I guess it depends on how you use it. Even so, dependence on externals for energy, followed by a slump in energy, is more reminiscent of drugs than spirituality. The author says that we have tornadoes and hurricanes in the US, but not in Europe because the squares harmonize the weather. The worsening of the weather in Europe, he says, is because so many squares are being destroyed by bulldozers and new developments. The average length of a side of the rectangle or square is 262 feet or 80 meters. They are often found in conjunction with others, often forming a ring with nine other squares in the landscape. If the geomantics of an area were not ideal, corrections were made. Squares are intended to be on top of a crossings of ley lines. Today, most people don't even acknowledge the existence of a ley line grid, but our ancestors certainly did. Places where ley lines crossed were considered places of power one could visit to recharge. The purpose of the squares was apparently to amplify or boost these places of power. If the ley line crossings did not exist at a place, then certain corrections were artificially added to create certain energy fields. The author of Kelton Shanzen and his team discovered these four elements of each square, which he defines as corrections, really energy amplifiers. One, correction ducts. Two, blind springs. Three, four-piece manipulation. Blind springs are small waterways that go from one level to another. Celtic squares are built above subterranean blind springs. The builders manipulated the pathways of these waters into certain patterns to have the desired energetic and magnetic effect. After digging up the earth in a square or rectangle, the builders made correctional shafts to find the locations of the four-piece manipulations and laid a ring-shaped water line or water loop. The water loop was connected to a mostly negatively polarized blind spring. Inlet and outlet of the spring were changed to connect to the water loop. They didn't return the soil they had dug out, but transported different layers of specific types of soil, sand, and gravel. The elevation of the squares is on average one meter higher than the ground surrounding it. The correctional shafts are on average 65 to 130 feet deep and 7 feet in diameter. In some cases, they were driven through bedrock. Some ducts are cased in wood to avoid soil sliding into it. The ducts were filled with different types of soils that stood in contrast to the soils the regular square was filled with. They were in different heights to each other. At the bottom of the duct, a pole was positioned as a resonator. Every duct is more or less cone or funnel shaped. Overgrown ducts can be detected through dowsing or circular thin or scant growth of plants at their top. The four piece manipulations are four resonating objects. For example, shards or clay fragments positioned to form a square of approximately 20 to 40 square feet or two to four square meters. They are buried at a depth of 6.5 feet or lower. Using geomantic terms, the author says two of the objects are positively and two negatively polarized. Positive and negative are diagonally crossed from each other. This creates a pyramid-shaped energy field that ranges three to four meters above the square. It was observed and recorded by several researchers that spending time on a Celtic square can reverse the polarity of a compass. Then north is shown as south and vice versa. The entrance of a square often contains two resonators made of quartz, five centimeters in diameter, one on the right and one on the left. They form an arch-shaped energy field. They are buried at a depth of 0.7 to 1.5 meters at the crossings of ley lines through which they are put into a state of permanent vibration. That concludes my brief summary of the book. It's insufficient to portray the book's depth, which is based on meticulous field research, pun intended. 
Eventually, some of this material will have to be translated or it will be like so many other things forgotten to history books. Knowledge dissemination relies on you. Share this video far and wide.